that react with the water. Direct hose steam to the, uh, the burning metal is going to result in a violent, and I do mean violent, they call it decomposition of the water, but it is an explosion. <laughs> it's impressive, but yeah, it is. <clears throat> it is violent. It is the picture that you see at the bottom of the page 1037 is this uh, indicative of what you're going to see. Obviously, with combustible metals burning, water is really the only effective way of keeping nearby exposures from going to ignition temperatures because putting water on, on it's not going to do you any good. If you don't have a Class D extinguishant, just let it burn. Most of the time we find these, we don't know that they're there. Time that I found out about it without knowing it was in a, a car fire. Chevy had put magnesium in their dashes. They had a Chevy pickup on fire and we hit it with water and it hit that. And so I went home and changed my pants. <laughs> so you're talking temperatures greater than 2,000 degrees with these metals even after they've been, they think you think that they're out, so. Some ways you can extinguish them, you can, you know, if you've got the agent available, but you don't, you know, you can always shovel it onto it. You know, basically you're just trying to create a crust layer on the top of it, but it's still gonna be hot underneath, so, you know, basically your, your best bet is to try and protect all the other Areas around it, just let it kind of cool itself out. So don't assume just because you think the flames are out that it's out. It just may not be visible. Car fires. Car fires are going to happen. You know, we're talking automobiles, minivans, sport utilities. You know, tractor trailers, RVs. They can happen because of a result of a collision. Um, most of the time, it's a result of a malfunction. Um, unfortunately, at times, it's an intentional act. They, somebody wanted to, to light the car on fire. It got stolen, and they got it and wanted to ditch it and didn't want any signs of who did it, so they just torch it. You need to be wearing full PPE when we're dealing with these types of fires because of all the chemicals and, and toxic gases that are going to be given off. Um, you're generating a lot because of the plastics and, and whatnot that are used to make these vehicles and the different type of fuel sources that we have. So we're talking gas, diesel, electrical, hybrids. CNG or LNG, you know, compressor liquefied natural gas, biofuels, you know, hydrogen. But you know, electrical engines are becoming more common, but you know, we're still dealing with gas and, and diesel a lot. So, and ultimately, the the most important thing we need to worry about is what our safety. Actually, one they don't put on here is uh, propane. Schwanz um, runs off propane. Schwanz. Yeah. yeah, Schwanz runs strictly propane. They've been running propane since the, which is funny, they've been running fuel propane since the fuel shortage in the 70s. Mm -hmm. yeah, Marvin Schwan decided to go to propane uh, as the fuel choice to lessen the impact of running gas and diesel at the time. And, Since then, they've been running propane on everything. So I actually had a buddy in high school who had a car that was propane. The tank was in the trunk. So, so when we do our size up on them, um, uh, well, before we even get to that, what do we need to worry about when the car is the car itself? 
what on a car do we need to worry about as a safety factor? Fuel lines, fuel lines, lines the tanks, power steering, transmission fluids, fluids, struts, glass, struts, glass, glass bumpers. So some of these have that, have those. Pneumatic bumpers that can take a hit and kind of stay, you know, take the hit but stay in place. But, you know, because of a fire or whatnot, that may go off. Airbags. Airbags. Yes. Yep. All right. So, back to what we need to know about size of considerations. So, do we need to divert traffic? Where's the, where's the vehicle located? Is it in a traffic lane? Is it on a shoulder? Right side, left side? You know, is it fully involved? Is it something that we need to worry about maybe diverting traffic around so that we are safe? Because ultimately that's the whole key to it. You know, follow your DOT guidelines or follow your SOPs as to how you're going to protect the scene itself Determine if there's any period, anybody in the vehicle and if we need extrication to take place. And that is going to be a rapid extrication. That is a life over limb. That is break glass, open door, grab, pull out. C-spine doesn't exist. You don't even worry about it. We just grab them and get them out. There's a fire. There's a car leaking any fluids. If we can confirm the vehicle or the fuel type, now, the manufacturers of vehicles are fairly nice because if it's a hybrid, they put hybrid on it, right? They don't have to. They are doing it to promote the hybrid fact. They are not required to put hybrid on the vehicle itself. Avoid any components under pressure. That would be your compressed natural gas, tanks, stuff like that. Isolate the vehicle from an ignition source, an external ignition source. Stabilize the vehicle. You know, if it's on a hill or whatnot, obviously with the fire going on, we may need to do something to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. This can be anywhere from throwing a a wood or a, a wheel chalk off of one of the trucks underneath of it so it doesn't roll to you know, if possible, grab a grab the winch off of a truck, run a winch out to it, and hook it so it doesn't go anywhere. Any down power lines, we're going to go back to the safety of dealing with electrical power lines and any additional other hazards that we may have as well. You know, and it's a car; it's not going anywhere. If it's on fire, it's not. You know, you're not really going to do much and. Really, the odds of them being able to drive it after the fact are pretty limited, so it's pretty much a defensive attack. You just stand back and spray water until it's out. You know. Basic attack procedures. Get your hose line in place. Take care of any burning exposures. We come at vehicle fires at a 45 degree angle. 45 because it, it avoids the exposure or the the hazards of the bumpers and struts and stuff like that. Like I told you earlier, we take care of fires that we come to. So anything outside of the, uh, the, the vehicle or anything that may be near occupants, when we get all those occupants out and we're all clear, um, you know, then you can go out to the car itself. Got to have inch and a half, inch and three quarters. It's got to be pushing 95 gallons a minute to be effective on a car fire. Booster lines are not going to, to take care of it. Be careful of those large capacity saddle tanks, especially on tractors and trailers. Kenworth was 55 gallons per side on that one. My Avalanche is 36. Um, the ambulance.
ounces. One is a 36, and we swear to God there's a 55-gallon drum underneath the other one. It was insane how much fuel was in that thing. Yeah. If you see that LNG or that PNG on the on the the tailgate, usually they're on pickups is where I see most of those, the CNGs and stuff. Trucks. Trucks, yeah. You know, be aware of those if you can still see it. Yeah. And be aware of, and you'll learn this through hazmat, to learn what's in the vehicle as to how close you want to be. So, any hazardous contents that may be explosive, you know, and you don't need to know necessarily what's in it, but you need to know what the signs are telling you as to whether or not it's an explosive item or a flammable item or items like that. So, or radioactive, for that matter. <coughs> Don't worry about it so much around here, but down in Texas and the southern states, I'm sure they have to deal with vehicles that have been modified to hide things. We don't have rolling meth labs like we used to. You know, so they went from home meth labs to field meth labs, so then they were doing rolling meth labs where they were in the truck, and now they can create it out of that. So, engine compartment or trunk compartment fires. Um, you need to get a hose line in there. You can direct it through the grill. It says that in the book, but I see a problem with that. What's in the grill? There's a radiator in the way. So, um, you know, you can do it through an air scoop, but you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of water in through an air scoop because you're only talking a two-inch gap, two-inch by maybe ten-inch gap. Um, you know, the best if you can get to it, if you can get to the car. Couple different methods to use. One method is to take an axe and at the corner of the, the hood, I'm gonna get my drawings out. I'm gonna erase my finger pointer person here. Hood of the car, go ahead and laugh now. Take an axe, crease it in the corner. Take a halligan, punch a hole, and just peel it back. Stick the nozzle in there, open her, crack her wide open, and just let it flood it in. Another option is just take your halligan, the flat side of the halligan, and get it in there, get it in as deep as you can, and then just peel it open and just lift that hood up just enough, get the nozzle in there, same idea. A lot of water in a very short and very small area will do the same trick. So, trunks. Um, best way to get into a trunk is like the picture shows you. Take a halogen point, pound it in there, punch the lock out, reach in there, hit the knock mechanism, it'll pop it open. Passenger compartments. Best way to get to a passenger compartment is to open the door. If the door won't open, break the glass. If you've never taken an extrication class, the best way to break glass in a vehicle is the bottom corner closest to you. Okay. If you try to if you try to take that halogen and try to take out a window and hit it in the middle you may not break it. If you go to a bottom corner and always come towards you so that your hand doesn't go through, you'll take, take the glass out right there. Nothing but little shards all over the place. Just remember that the front windshield will not shatter. You just put a hole into it. They do talk about driving a, uh, a piercing nozzle through the hood, fender, and wheel wells, and stuff like that. And if you have that, that's great. You know. But if you don't, just peel the hood. Undercarriage fires. Um, 
you'll see those a lot of those will be indicative. You'll see the fuel dripping as it's on fire. It's kind of neat. Um, best way to do those is to bounce it. Do a nice straight stream, bounce it, and let it come up and hit it. Then once you've kind of knocked it down a little bit, pop the hood, get it from the top side. Alternative fuels, you know, you're going to have those vehicle logos, uh, fuel specific, uh, fuel special, you know, you're going to have special ports, you know, electrical, you'll see the, the difference in that door than you would a regular fuel door. Um, you know, a lot of them now, you know, everybody understands that the Prius is a hybrid, stuff like that, but. I learned years ago from a gentleman who does extrication. <coughs> He's an extrication guru and actually writes for um, fire engineering in their extrication stuff. He's from Texas. And he told us years ago that they are not required to label the hybrids. You know, in all alternatives, we talked about them already. Your biodiesels, your natural gases, stuff like that, hybrids. There's that there may be no visual indicators. The vehicle's using an alternative fuel source. So if we have a feeling that it is alternative, park at least 100 feet away, uphill, upwind, in a 45 degree angle. Always full PPE, SCBA required. Non-sparking extrication tools. Don't use flares. I'm not sure how many people use flares anyway. Should always have a backup line deployed no matter what we're doing. Anytime we're flowing water, should have a backup line. We have the ability to have the specific Extinguishing available to us, we should be using it. Remember with your natural gas flames, that's a it's lighter than air, so it's gonna float. It's stored under pressure, it's got a visible flame, so we can see it. Your LPGs, safer than gas, it's a colorless, odorless, still stored under pressure. Those electrical vehicles should have those visible indicators. The door may look the same, but that most of them are going to have those visible indicators. It's going to tell you it's electric. Yeah. Ethanol, methanol. It's pretty much, hell, you know more about it than anybody. What's that? Ethanol. Oh, ish. Yeah, ish. <laughs> it's, it's, it's booze. It's booze. It's gas. It burns. Uh, they talk a little bit about biodiesel as fuel. Hydrogen is becoming more pre more prevalent in, uh, in North America now. Um, thing with hydrogen is it, it burns clean enough that the flame is actually invisible, especially during the day. So you get to a vehicle fire and it gets really warm, but you know you're not really sure what's going on. You know the best way to see it is through a TI. When you're dealing with hybrids and electrical, blue, orange, and yellow are not your friend. That is the wire that is running the electricity from the battery pack to the motor. Um, it can be anywhere from the undercarriage underneath in the middle to the rails on each side. If you see, and that goes for 
not only in fire side, but in extrication side. If you see one of those, and they're a good size wire, if you see one, don't touch it, don't cut it. Stack and pile materials really are a royal pain in the rear end is what they are. They burn and they burn and they burn. So you have to use different tactics to deal with them. Uh, usually raw materials, cardboard, cardboard bales, um, you know, rolls of hay, so fertilizers, stuff like that. Best thing you can do to them is to just get it spread out. I have unrolled a bale of hay. It's a lot of, a lot of walking. You just keep pushing and rolling, pushing and rolling. So, small unattached structures. <coughs> we do this as always from an exterior. We always do an exterior style attack, defensive style. Um, your volume of smoke, your fire as well as the color can be indicative of what may be on the inside of it, whether it's raw materials or plastics or whatnot. Be aware, wary of those. Um, those are where you're gonna find your, your labs at. So you could have some makeshift wiring and stuff like that involved in them. Maybe a little volatile chemicals, a little anhydrous, you know. Maybe they got some makeshift wiring because they've got some growing lights in there because they're they got a garden on the inside. <coughs> chemicals used in the production of some illegal drugs are extremely toxic and volatile. Incidents involving them may require the assistance of trained hazmat personnel. That is true if it's you know, in large quantity, but hazmat personnel, they, uh, they're there to assist you, so they're only gonna do what you ask them to do anyway. A lot of their stuff would be clean up and just cordoning off and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Trash container fires, just because their trash containers don't take them for granted you don't know what's in them, what's been thrown in them. Just because it's a restaurant doesn't mean that that's the only thing in there is last night's supper that somebody didn't eat. You can have a lot of other stuff being thrown in there. People like to drive by and toss their trash in there, especially stuff they don't want in their own trash. So hazardous materials can be, can be in there. Um, aerosol cans, batteries, stuff like that. Do not take them for granted. They are a full PPE SCBA required fire, just like everything else. Ground cover fires. Usually this is, this will be the end of it. And ground cover fires can be as small as a backyard fire. You know, a little grass fire, but it can be as big as, you know, a devastating wildfire that they that we see out west and then sometimes out east. For us, it's a lot of ground cover stuff. It's it's weeds, grass, field crops, brush, you know, stuff like that. So you know, they uh, they start in a whole lot of different ways: lightning strikes, um, sparks from rock slides, arson, campfires, <coughs> discarded materials. Sparks from machineries. Um, I don't see it as much, but um, stock chopping. Yeah, we don't see it much, but mostly a small amount of it. Yeah, you know that's we used to have those a number of years ago. We had you, they'd be out chopping stalks and pitch a rock, and it was dry enough that spark went off. But it was never the little stuff that we ever worried about. It was when it got into the neighbor's field that became the problem. So if the neighbor he never turn around. It was the item. He, he hit the end rope, turned, went through the whole field, and that hit a rock with the end rope. He just lit that fire the whole way down. Yep. No, it's cord stuff. Yeah. 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 Had that. 
bailers on from the woods back and he got a bale on fire. You know, pitched a rock while he was putting a bale together and it started smoldering and pretty soon he drops it out and he gets enough air and then the bale itself. I haven't seen the baler be on fire yet. I don't know, but I left, dropped that bale and pulled up the road by a mile. Mm -hmm. Get behind the whole bale is pulling you off. Pulling you off. Combine fires. Bearings are always going out in the balers. Are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bearings are changing. Yeah. Yeah. Many of the things that we have to worry about when we're dealing with ground fire, cover fires are going to be your fuel, you know, whether it be weeds or tall grass or stalks and what the weather's been like. Obviously the drier the drier the fall, the worse that we deal with them. And topography, hills and, and whatnot. So ground fire cover fires can be deadly to firefighters even if they're working in very light fields or working during the overhaul phase of an operation because we get complacent. So we put ourselves into danger. Types of ground cover fire, you know, a ground fire is going to be dead organic material. Um, they're slow moving, they smolder, and they can go undetected forever because they just kind of just fall. They don't do a whole heck of a lot. Your surface fires are most common types. That's your low lying shrubs and grass and vegetation. Um, and then your crown fires, we don't see those really that often around here. Those are the wind-driven, high-intensity ones. Um, they basically move through the tops of tree covers and just jump. Um, they tend to be called ladder fires because the dead brush underneath of it gets lit and it, the heat rises, it just lights the top of it and off of it goes. So. Different types of fuels we deal with in those. Your subsurface fuels, it's gonna be your roots and stuff like that. Your surface fuel, fuels, that's gonna be your field crops, your grass, anything up to about six foot tall. And then your aerial stuff is anything over six. It's gonna be your tree limbs and brush, branches and stuff like that. Um, you know, fuel size is gonna be small and light. The smaller the lighter, the faster it burns. If it's tightly compacted, it's going to slow it down. Um, but then again, if it's, you know, fuels are all packed, are all close together, it's going to make it go faster. The heat's going to transfer. So, um, has anybody been on a, a cornfield fire? I've seen cornfield fires. I've been one. Now I'm not on fire. <laughs> what's, what's so weird about cornfield fires? Popcorn? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> they float. It's weird. You'll see it, and you'll have this this area that's here, and next thing you know is it's all of a sudden it's over here as well, and you don't see it get over there, but it's just how it almost floats through the, the cover part of it. Just hop there. Yeah. Oh. Is that from the heat that the corn itself puts off? Yeah, and then with the you know with the embers flying, you know they just land in the right spot and it just lights off another section. So. Our combine fire was the alternate got just below where they were trying to short it, and they told us it was super short the whole time. Um, wind plays a big push into it too. Uh, temperature outside, hot and dry, humidity, any precipitation. You know, obviously if it hasn't rained for a while, and even if it does, you know, if you've had a really dry summer and dry fall, and then all of a sudden you get one good day of rain. You know, everybody's like, oh, I can burn. Well, no, because it didn't wet stuff down enough, and people make mistakes, and that's what ends up happening is they think they can burn that, that pit out back, and next thing you know is it takes off. So topog topography plays a big role into it. You know, your hills and your slopes. <clears throat> the steepness of the slope. So if it's at the bottom of the slope, where the fire is at, it's going to climb that hill really quick. Especially the steeper the slope, the faster it's going to climb it because the heat rises and preheats everything ahead of it. 
your aspect's going to play a big part of it. A area that faces south will burn, have more likely and burn faster than an area that faces the north. Because the south is in the sun all day, where the north is not. You know, local, local terrain, ridges, canyons, stuff like that. That's stuff we deal with a lot around here. You know, and drainage areas as well. Ground cover fire, things that you're really gonna kinda need to know about it for the most part. You know, you got your point of origin. So on the back side of the point of the origin is gonna be your keel. And then it's gonna flank out your left flank, your right flank. It's gonna have fingers. But the main part of it at the point is gonna be the head of the fire. You might have little spot fires, little islands, areas that just it didn't burn. It burned around. Um, and then all those, all those um, areas are 2, 10, 52, 53. It tells you about that all. If we're fighting those fires, where are we fighting them from? From the, from the black. black. Always fighting from the black. Always wearing the appropriate clothing, helmet and eye protection, neck shrouds, flame retardant shirts and pants. Um, you know, if you don't have wildland gear, then just wear your bunker gear. Yes, I know it's hotter than Jesus when you're out there walking and that stuff, but you know, it's the best thing. Gloves, um, try to have the proper uh, a mask. You can go after it two different ways, direct attack, Go right after the burning fuels, uh, indirect attack, you know, controlling the ground cover around it, make a control line. You have you have available to you the uh, Iowa or the federal um, burn crew. Is based out of Milford. There is a burn crew. They have all the fun equipment. You know, so I know was it Hartley Everly a few years ago had a massive field fire that actually jumped the highway. That actually ended up taking out a house. I think it was more towards Everly than it was the Hartley area. Um, yeah, because then the people came up here and the hotel burned down. So yeah, it was the next night. Yeah, you <laughs> had that now. Yeah, that was right. So. You know, if you, you know, if it gets bad enough and it's one that you just can't get control of, you know, don't be afraid to call them. Um, you be aware of what ground is burning as well. If you have a ground cover fire that burns federal land, you can actually get paid for it. The federal government will pay you for that because that just means that they don't have to go do it. <laughs> so, you know, obviously direct direct attack is exactly what it says, indirect, you know, we're at different distances, uh, unburned fuel to self-extinguish itself, fire's too hot, it's too big for direct. Safety factors for ground cover, its location, its type. <coughs> access to it, what exposures are around it, the weather, the wind, the wind velocity, topography, uh, visibility and, and resources available to you. You can't have enough water available to you when you're dealing with large grass fires, so don't be, don't be afraid to call for more help. The LECS concept, lookouts, know where the fire is and where it's going. Um, communication is key above, below, and adjacent to you. Escape routes, always have one. Don't get yourself stuck in the green and have to drive a brand new truck through the fire. Chief, my chief at the time. Brand new truck, 90 year old. Did you get to do it too? No? <laughs> that sucks. Ten standards, 
The all 10 standards are on 1056. You can see them all there. I'm not going to read them all. Maybe you guys can see them. Not fire hazards. <laughs> Animals, insects, fences, power lines. Animal traps, especially when you're dealing with field fires, especially around water sources. Who is your best friend on a farm field fire? Or with, with a disc. 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 I thought we only got one yeah. or two in the field with us. Yeah. Well, a smart farmer will always have one available to them. A disc will be set ready to go. Hey, look, it's not moving. Just fell. I knew we were going to be here a while. I was hoping maybe I could get it done in time that we could play for a little bit. But.